everyone for uh, coming to this exciting talk. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our visiting professor, Dr. Sharmila Madhandar from the University of California at San Francisco from the uh, Department of Radiology and uh, Imaging, Biomedical Imaging Sciences. Um, professor Madhandar did her bachelor's degree at St. Stephen's and uh, University of Delhi in India, and then she did her master's and PhD degrees at Yale University, and then she stayed uh, at Yale for her uh, postdoc. Um, her bachelor's and, and uh, excuse me, her, her master's and PhDs uh, were in um, engineering and applied physics, and then her postdoc was in the Department of Radiology. And uh, thereafter, she went to the, uh, UCSF, where she's been ever since, um, and uh, she has joint appointments in the departments of radiology um, biomedical imaging, bioengineering, and therapeutic sciences. She currently serves as the Vice Chair of Research in Radiology and as the Director of the Center for Intelligent Imaging, as well as the Director for the Musculoskeletal Quantitative uh, Imaging Research Group. She's worked in the area of quantitative imaging for over 30 years. Her research uses and develops imaging technologies centered around MRI, PET MRI, micro-CT, and HRPP QCT. She studies morphology, biochemistry, and composition in cartilage, bone, intervertebral disc, muscle, and other tissues to analyze the complex interactions between the biomechanics, biochemistry, and musculoskeletal diseases. Her clinical foci have been osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, low back pain, aging, and joint injuries. I'll say that Professor Majum Dar is impressive in so many regards. Uh, her research has been cited more than 35,000 times. She was recently named as one of the top 500 female scientists in the United States and the top 800 scientists in the world. Her ability to secure NIH funding is truly unmatched. Her funded projects cover the spectrum of the NIH alphabet and include uh, research grants, fellowships, cooperative agreements, center grants, and more. To date, she's been awarded more than $45 million as principal investigator uh, since her first R01 in 1992. Mind you, again, this is only including funds as a principal investigator. My former PhD student, Corinne Roach, completed a postdoctoral fellowship under her mentorship. Corinne describes her as fun, inspiring, witty, fiercely loyal, no bullshit, and obviously intelligent. <laughs> Clearly, she's a fantastic scientist, mentor, and leader. The presentation today is on the explosion of AI and musculoskeletal imaging. Please join me in providing a warm Utah welcome to Professor Sharmila Majumdar. but it's great to have these numbers. I'm going to take these numbers back, maybe add a zero here and there for my department, and let's see where that gets me. Uh, but having said that, let me say that it's a pleasure to be here. I'm delighted, honored to be here this morning. And this is only my second visiting professorship or uh, excursion since uh, COVID, so it is very special. It makes me almost believe that I could be normal again. So uh, thank you for this invitation. When Andy invited me a, almost a year ago now, it was literally the first conference that we'd, I think, been post-COVID. So I think all in all, we are trying to get back to normal, and I'm glad to be part of this journey with you all today. So I've pivoted a little bit from quantitative imaging uh, and focused on AI over the last couple of years. And the reason for that is translation of quantitative imaging to the clinic is technically challenging and very tedious. And it is that which made me really think that we have to do something about it. And AI became sort of the buzzword several, a couple of years ago, I would say now, in biomedical imaging. And that's why I dove into uh, uh, artificial intelligence with an amazing team of people. And so I'm going to give you some examples I'm going to, uh, res uh, since this is primarily an orthopedic surgery grand round, my desire and pension to go into imaging and sequences and reconstructions that we are doing using AI, I will refrain from, but for later, for the radiology team, I'm ready to have those discussions as well. So in the context of imaging, we do use AI for technology de uh, development, acquisition, and reconstruction. We're doing a lot of that for faster, safer, quantitative imaging, reducing the artifacts, and of course, improving the very tedious workflow of imaging. 
But after that, imaging, after the images are acquired, there's a whole host of things such as tissue and organ segmentation, which is really necessary if you want to take imaging to the next level of quantitation. Merging imaging data with microscopy, biomechanics, etc., extracting features that are normal and pathological, and then of course integrating it with other data like function, uh, electronic health records, uh, genomics, and so on. And our goal is to apply this in actual real world problems, and that's what the research is all about. The translation too will be all about that, but translation of AI has a lot of hurdles that one has to jump over, and we can talk about that again in question and answer series, the ethics, the liability, and the ease with which the clinical uh, enterprise is set up to translate these tools into the clinic. So there are a lot of, although AI is a buzzword, it's being used, AI tools available, its actual translation still requires a lot of work and a lot of regulatory steps to jump through. So having said that, I'm going to use osteoarthritis or knee de degeneration as my model. To give you a few examples of AI, if I get too down into the weeds, just raise your hand and just wave me away and I'll go more into the applications. But the reality is osteoarthritis, everybody knows in this, con in this context, in this community, is a degenerative disease. It's a chronic disease leading to chronic pain and disability and its prevalence is increasing. You, you, more than anybody else, know the preponderance of total knee replacements, total hip replacements, the costs that are uh, ensue, and so on. Uh, but the contributors to pain are poorly understood. It's, it, it's expected to be by 2020. It's really an old slide, right? By 2030, it was supposed to be significantly higher. And I think one of the most important symptoms is really pain, which is poorly described, it's subjective. And clearly there are structural and morphological changes that actually occur in osteoarthritis in the knee joint. I'm speaking about the knee joint, I'll speak a little bit about the hip joint. Now osteoarthritis also covers the ankle and very, other, very many other joints, so the applications could be easily translatable along those lines. Despite everything that is known about magnetic resonance imaging for its soft, soft tissue contrast, ability to detect, detect symptoms such as synovitis, car, bone marrow edema-like lesions, which are important, cartilage thinning, etc., as well as other features uh, of uh, cartilage and meniscus degeneration, important for joint degeneration and osteoarthritis, Radiographs are still the FDA standard to date. FDA still hasn't accepted MR as its, draw, as its basis for uh, defining osteoarthritis. One of the primary reasons that we started looking into this is in the research field, joint regeneration is defined by Kelvin Lawrence score. In, it's a scoring system, an ancient scoring system of plain radiographs. Now, our radiologists are now being asked by orthopedic surgeons, and they're complaining bitterly because for every knee x-ray, they actually have to do the Kelvin Lawrence grading. I don't know if that happens everywhere, but there are not just our, our algorithms, which actually have trained using the osteoarthritis initiative data set, which already had Kelvin Lawrence grading in 5,000 subjects with uh, knee uh, x-rays. We trained a model to look and predict the Kelvin Lawrence score uh, at, and, and the Kappa for that uh, model was about 0.84, which is reasonably good from the perspective of, and uh, is similar to that of radiologists for predicting, uh, you know, mild osteoarthritis, no osteoarthritis, moderate and severe OA. The real disagreements come up, the real difficult areas are the moderate uh, and mild areas for osteoarthritis. Those are the real difficult ones. But having said that, what is the osteoarthritis initiative? I'm going to be using that data set a lot for looking at the knee. It's, uh, it was essentially um, a miraculous uh, study that was designed several years ago, two decades ago almost, for 5,000 subjects recruited across four main centers. Uh, in the United States, the, all subjects were either had risk of OA, ha had incident OA, or progressing in OA, uh, and were considered the progression cohort. The 5,000 subjects have been imaged over 10 plus years. 
there's magnetic resonance images obtained at 3 Tesla. At that time, 3 Tesla was literally a dream. It was just being put forward, but it was a very foresighted decision. There were four centers with three set dedicated 3 Tesla scanners which did these studies. There's MR, there's radiographs, there's uh, you know accelerator data. There is uh, some of it is genomic data, biomarker data. There's a lot of data on this cohort. It is by far one of the best resources for looking and training algorithms as we have learned. But ha so we can do this with radiographs, but then the real, real issue is image and tissue segmentation, for example, in MR images and CT images. I'm not going to go into it. AI and, uh, you know, convolutional neural networks have changed the entire face of imaging because of the ability to tr train networks for segmenting various tissues. I mean, in MR, you can segment into vertebral discs, muscles, and we'll talk about that a little bit. In the knee, you can segment the knee, the cartilage, the bone, the cartilage, the meniscus, and the various different tissues, shoulder, bone. It just has opened up the whole uh, arena for translation of quantitative tools, not just for clinic, but also for research. Imagine you no longer have postdocs who you've hired, uh, sometimes even radiologists, postdocs from um, different countries who come in and their first task is to sit and painfully uh, spend hour, days, hours, years segmenting uh, tissues from MR images. All of that tissue, all of those segmentations have been put to work to actually develop AI algorithms, CNN convolution neural networks, which are trained using those segmentations to automatically segment tissues. It's been a huge step from, for all of us from that perspective. So basically you need, uh, uh, let's talk about uh, uh, the knee joint for example. So in order to solve the problem we need accurate segmentations, we have a lot of that. So algorithms have been developed, many, in, uh, many, many institutions, many uh, groups have been doing this. So we have been running a challenge and uh, we participated in multiple challenges and essentially using a mo model which is basically an ensemble of different models, we've got very good segmentation, for example, of the femur, tibia, uh, patella, meni uh, cartilage, menis menisci. So from the perspective of segmentation of these tissues, we, from MR images, we're in a good spot. What can you do with that? You can actually calculate the morphology of those tissues, thickness, thickness distributions. The, uh, with the meniscus, you can be looking at the shape features of the meniscus and many more. Now, but each of these tissues actually in degeneration have lesions. So you can actually start looking at essentially the lesions and training models for detecting some of those lesions. And that's what some of the things that we've been doing. In cartilage thickness uh, segmentation and calculation, the OAI data set has been amazing because we have actually segmented the entire cartilage uh, of all uh, subjects in the OAI over several years and looked at the trajectory of cartilage changes. You find there are people, there are individuals who actually have cartilage thicknesses which show plateau thickening. So some of them actually show thickening. There are groups that show accelerated thinning and each of the characteristics of these groups are very, very different. Why is this important? This is sort of uh, uh, epidemiological or large scale research. Why is this important? Because from the perspective of orthopedic surgery, from the perspective of knowing the individual, you know that in a population there are certain features, demographic features, other features possibly related to also not just the cartilage characteristics but also to the shape of the bone that actually cause accelerated thinning or thick, th you know, plateaued thinning of the cartilage or degen joint degeneration. So ultimately in, in clinical translation many of these models could then be translated looking at the vast amounts of clinical data we have in order to characterize the patients and ultimately characterize the patients as to what particular box they fall into and what is their risk factor for further degeneration as one moves on. So from that perspective it is extremely important. 
I'm going to talk a little bit of AI aided MR diagnosis, and I'm starting with joint, joint degeneration. I'm going to be bringing up, it up several times. Now, we talked about this at dinner yesterday, and it's not to minimize, essentially, the ability of radiological grading, but it is to actually introduce the subjectivity that exists in any kind of evaluation of physiological images or of uh, any kind of uh, medical condition, so to speak, the opinions of two individual doctors can actually vary very significantly. And by the same token, even in two different institutions, in the same institution they can vary, just as much they can vary between institutions. It also depends who you've been trained by. For years I was hearing from uh, uh, the orthopedic surgeons, there is the Freddie Foo trained surgeons and the other trained surgeons, etc. By the way, they do their procedures and they probably have some uh, 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 outcome um, uh, effect at the end of the day. So, reading MR images of the knee, looking at cartilage severity, for example, looking at normal partial and full lesion tears, if you compare two radiologists, you get, for example, R1 and R2 or two radiologists, R2, R3 you know, third one radiologist. So to look, basically categorize, we've trained a model to categorize normal lesion, in normal cartilage, partial and uh, full lesions in the cartilage itself. The, the uh, DL model, the deep learning model, has about 90% uh, efficiency for looking at accuracy for determining normal cartilage. So that in itself, if you could just sort out the normal and say don't look at it anymore or look at it, uh, or do, you know, look at it with, in your uh, in good time, or if you, seventy one percent for um, essentially for partial and for a little bit uh, uh, lower for full lesion tears is is the DL model's performance. But if you compare the performance of two radiologists within each other, you see the performance is approximately of the same ma order. So clearly, your DL model could be assisting very quickly to sort out the images. But one of the things that we did is we did the study, we actually have a model which looks at not just cartilage, but bone, ligaments, meniscus compartments. It divides up the knee into six compartments for cartilage, six for bone and so on, and gives you 60 probabilities of whether it's normal, has a lesion, a full lesion or a partial lesion, essentially using the OAI data set. And the multi-class sensitivity raised from about 70 to 89 percent for cartilage. Now that is well within the realm of two radiologists reading the images. And Basically, we portray the results in this format so the radiologist can look at a map like this and say it's normal versus severe lesions, etc., in the specific compartment. So, what we started doing is how do you validate something like this? We took 50 clinical MRI cases graded by a senior radiologist and two trainees. And if you actually look at the attending versus trainee one, you can see essentially that you can get, get the standard grading, the agreement is of the order of about 0.4 between, in cartilage, about 0.6 for tra trainee one in meniscus, ligament and bone. But after a washout period, we provided the uh, AI guided, the DL models output to the trainee and the trainee graded the images again. And uh, at the second period, the improvement, there was improvement in the performance of trainee one and it was significant. Training two seems to be doing really well, I don't know. Uh, but um, it really, so there was an improvement in the training. So this is again one way of using the tool. I'm not going to be telling you that it's radiology is going to be graded by AI, but what I'm saying is it actually improves the uh, training, uh, training as well as the grading and also makes it much faster. And from a researcher perspective, at least there is a variable that we can get uh, outcome from a, a model as well as get some partial agreement between radiologists, etc. It really makes our life that much easier from the research perspective looking at joint degeneration as well. But osteoarthritis is not just a morphological or uh, de joint degeneration, not morphological alone. I, you've all uh, at least here been to uh, dinner we were talking about T1 row and T2 estimation uh, in the joint and you can do it in other organs as well. 
and we've talked about uh, cartilage degeneration is preceded by biochemical changes in cartilage, the loss of collagen and its orientation in the cartilage, for example, reflected by the T2 times. And T1 rho is another metric which can be evaluated from MRI, which looks at proteoglycan depletion. And together they have been shown to actually provide information about joint degeneration post-ACL ACL injury, jo uh, after meniscal injuries, and it also shown longitudinal changes in osteoarthritis and so on. So uh, it, has been, it, it has been studied uh, and shown relationships with biomechanics and function and has been looked at very extensively and the orthopedic field is fairly familiar with it. What are the limitations of using T1 row and T2? Firstly, segmentation of cartilage. AI can help that. Uh, in our clinic now, we have actually translated some of these tools and the orthopedic surgeons are requesting the T1 row and T2 maps, which is being provided by a 3D lab in radiology to the clinic itself. How it's going to be finally utilized and outcomes, of course, the jury is still out on that. But then orthopedic, as I said, in the current state of the art, orthopedic radiologists and musculoskeletal radiologists, same thing, do not do relaxation time mapping. You will kill everybody if you ask them to sit down and segment those cartilage. But because we can do this now, we've been doing it, but what does it actually tell you? I've shown you some of the trajectory analysis we did for cartilage thickness. In uh, the osteoarthritis initiative, it, th there is an entire co uh, cohort that, uh, that has T2 uh, mapping in one knee. So looking at that, we've actually calculated the T2 across the entire osteoarthritis initiative data set, and we found that the classification accuracy of T2 using one of these convolutional neural networks, where we first trained it to, uh, using the cohort of normal subjects, the progression cohort, those that will have prog uh, are at risk for progression because of various risk factors, etc., for osteoarthritis, as well as the mm, is essentially the what is the green is the control and uh, cohort and yeah. So we found that essentially the classification accuracy of the T2 values of 95.2%. So having trained a model, the model with 95.2% uh, accuracy classified the subjects as to which cohort they belong to using T2 alone. Now, it's a very, very controlled data set. What does this do for you? What does this do for orthopedic surgery? At least it sets some boundaries and some limits for progression of joint degeneration, which can actually be modeled if T2 data is collected reliably in the clinic in a standardized manner. It can provide a, a very, very good metric for moving forward in terms of quantifying some of these things. I'm going to introduce some new stuff that we've been doing along with um, um, uh, artificial intelligence and what this has done even for the research world. Uh, the knee degeneration, jo knee osteoarthritis, joint degeneration, whether it be post-injury or just age-related degeneration, does not occur uh, in uh, isolation. The joints are connected, the biomechanics are connected. So one of the things we've begun doing is what is the relationship between the hip and the knee? We haven't moved to the ankle as, as of yet because there's only that much machine time you can get within a particular NIH grant and keep a patient in for that long and no longer. But one of the things that we've done with the ease of actually being able to segment the images really efficiently get these relaxation time maps in a cohort, in a co cohort which may have hip osteoarthritis, we are beginning to look at the relationship, for example, between the biochemical degeneration, early degeneration in the hip versus the knee. We look at the relationship in the uh, same limb, intralimb analysis, and we are basically seeing that there is a correlation, but the nature of the correlation changes, for example, if you look at the patella cartilage as an entire whole and you look at the biochemical uh, uh, G1 row of uh, the patella cartilage, its relationship to hip cartilage, acetabular cartilage and femoral cartilage follows a different direction. Clearly there are the bi there's biomechanics, there's loading, there's bi body mass index effects and all of this. These have been adjusted for age and BMI, but we've also got gait measures. So this brings up an amazing way of linking the different joints. We could similarly move 
to interlimb relationships where again you can examine uh, the relationships between the uh, hip cartilage, the uh, T1 row of the whole patella cartilage and how the uh, acetabular and femoral ca cartilage actually uh, inter interact with the knee from that perspective. So it brings, uh, why should it matter? Why should it matter? Some of this research could actually potentially guide orthopedic surgery later on, for example, looking at how to treat the complex, complex patient, how to, how to proceed, how to perceive joint degeneration across the different joints and actually go into interventions. Is it, does it make sense, even if you do cartilage, uh, you, you know, you do uh, uh, harvesting of cartilage, where does it make sense? Not that very many people are doing that very, uh, anymore, but there are so many different applications where this kind of work, which was absolutely tedious and time consuming, has been made possible. The other thing, uh, again, joint degeneration, osteoarthritis does not just depend on arti articular cartilage. I'm not going into meniscus and meniscus shape. We've just been working on that as well. But muscle, muscle and muscle fatty infiltration plays an amazing, Im immense role in guiding how the joint will recover post-surgery, how you, uh, the progression in case of degeneration will progress, etc. Age plays a role in this. Diabetes plays a role in this. So it's opening up the ability. If we could translate muscle cross-sectional imaging and ideas of exactly what the thigh muscles are doing, this is again uh, some of the data that we've been collected in the hip OA subjects where we've seen significantly lower cross-sectional areas. We've seen uh, differences in function in patients with osteoarthritis, with knee flexion and extension and the various things such as that. Uh, it's not me, thank God. It could have been me. Um, uh, it, it, it brings up an amazing way of actually starting to look at the whole joint from the perspective of all the different tissues and relating essentially some of the functional measures that we are actually measuring are like sit to stand and the six minute walk test, chair stand test, etc. People could be doing that on their iPhone. It actually opens up the ability to collect big data across a huge uh, cohort of individuals and actually model the outcomes moving forward. So the contributors to pain are poorly understood. You all know all these numbers about the huge increase in, uh, in osteoarthritis, the need for joint replacement, etc. To, but to what extent does imaging actually predict who will undergo joint, total knee replacement? I'm going to put an asterisk to this total knee, who will undergo total knee replacement because I'll come back to it later. But outcome prediction is really important. In the osteoarthritis initiative, we have subjects who have undergone, after being in this pro project, uh, total knee replacement in five years' time. And the, these were the patients who were de de defined as the TKR patients, and we had thousand subjects like that. The controls were those who did not undergo a total knee replacement. We trained an Im basically a purely data-driven model using just the imaging data, the demographics, the various uh, you know age, gender, BMI, uh, and other features to train a model which basically uh, looked at subjects who were TKR, underwent total knee replacement in five years, and those who did not. And then thereafter, we used, we, we used x-rays and we used MR. And thereafter, we used the model to predict, again, in a test set, who would undergo a total knee replacement in five years. And if you actually look at the model prediction, the interesting thing is if you use MRI alone, all the, the, the area under the curve for the prediction is of the order of about 0.34, and for, if you use all the pain, essentially use the x-ray, it's about 0.8 or so. So there is, but the interesting thing is, in the control subjects, even people who are not considered to have any osteoarthritis in the beginning, radiographic osteoarthritis, they had no signs of osteoarthritis, some of them underwent total knee replacement within five years. And if you use MR alone, it's a small subject group, but you actually see that they are picking, you are able to predict 
that uh, with point, uh, area under the curve is 0.94, which is pretty good to predict those who will undergo total knee replacement within a five-year period. So there is information in the MRI. There's also information in the X-ray. Don't get me wrong. This it's there. So imaging and data-driven uh, information can actually look and predict the possibility of having to undergo total knee replacements. Now. I'm putting this out there because total knee replacements is not, are not totally dependent on just the imaging findings or on the clinical manifestations. There are other factors such as access and gender and uh, various other things that come into play there. So pain is poorly understood. So one of the things that we've been trying to do is trying to understand pain a little bit better in the osteoarthritis initiative in this particular data set. If we can segment cartilage and bone and we can get the bone shape, we've got features of cartilage morphology, we've got features of the bone surface and bone changes. By the way, the bone shape does change over time in osteoarthritis, post ACL injury, etc. I was a, not a believer. I was extremely skeptical. I gave one of my colleagues, Valentina, very difficult time, and I laughed at her when she started doing this project. I was very, and I'm never allowed to forget that, and I'm now eating my hat because I'm seeing exactly that it does change over time. And it's not change, it, it's the change in overall morphology and shape and relationships. And I guess the uh, orthopedic surgeons have always known that, you know, the uh, tibial notch and so on does change. So we can get bone shape from bone segmentations. We can get T2 fitting from this data so we can get some idea about biomechanics. Using this entire, uh, using these, all these metrics, now we can, d d because we've got the entire knee segmented, we have essentially a map or a depiction on the surface of the bone of all of these features like thickness as well as biochemistry plus you have the shape features one way of looking at this is you basically transform everything onto a spherical coordinate system basically on and flatten everything out and then you look at the overlay of all of these features such as the bone shape the cartilage thickness and the t2 map and in this in this large space, you can identify, you can using this large space, you can basically train a model to look at patients with chronic pain and patients who don't have chronic pain. And we looked at that, and chronic pain was defined as people who reported knee pain uh, over half of the days of the month for more than six months of the past 12 months, and those who did not. We trained this model to look at pain versus no pain. The model predicted a cohort with pain. And when you actually look at the model with all of the data fused, you essentially see the sensitivity and the specificity in the area under the curve for the models. But the most interesting thing, perhaps, is not the numbers. The idea is that when you look at the different bones, you see a different performance of even the fused data. But more importantly, when you actually project and you start looking at these heat maps, you see the activations, where the regions, what are the regions on the bone surface which are actually responsible for the, uh, for the pain. It's completely different for the different bones is what we found. We found a variety of manifestations. What is this saying? That pain is multifactorial combination of biomarkers for chronic pain. Now, you, we've always understood that this is the concept, that pain can't be identified. It's not a single tissue. It can be different for different, depending on what your biomechanics are. But in order, how does this, how does this matter to you? This matters because if you can have this model, if this model could be extended into your clinical database in the clinic itself, then ultimately when the patient, next patient walks in and you've got a trained model, then you can actually look and calculate these parameters, look at where this patient falls as per this model and look and see what is this patient likely to be, where is the, what is the real source of the pain, how can this be managed. This is the potential. This is where this could go. With the, we call this deep pain. We talked about changes in model, bone shape changes. So because in the osteoarthritis initiative we have bone shape over all these years, we've trained a, a model which we call the virtual bone aging model. So we've looked at 48 month uh, bone surface changes and the most interesting thing I think in this is it's the coolness of the picture of course and the colors. But basically when you look at essentially the prediction of the bone shape changes and actually the longitudinal changes, look at the bone shape, you see the little divot here and the little divot here. The prediction actually does predict 
you've trained the model using the first two years of changes in bone shape to predict what's going to happen in year four. So the model is able to, to show some of these changes in bone shape over time. This is very early work, but this is actually showing that you can actually predict bone shape changes if some of these shape modes are particularly responsible for joint degeneration or post-ACL injury if it's heading towards something which, was, which could be degenerative and plays a role in cartilage degeneration. It opens up a different way of looking at each individual subject-specific joint I don't know, interventions. I haven't talked at all about image acquisition, and I'll bring up a few, uh, because it's, I'm an imaging person, I want to talk a little bit about imaging. Often contrast, uh, uh, contrast media are used in imaging, but it increases imaging time. There are issues with regards to kidney function and so on and so forth. So we did this project. It's basically in rheumatoid arthritis, but uh, I don't know how it will work in osteoarthritis or in joint degeneration where inflammation levels might be lower. But essentially using a particular model, we've trained a model to look at pre-gadolinium T1 images, segmented out, this is the wrist by the way in case people are interested, and segmented out the regions of interest, trained the model to specifically look at, we had matched pre-GAD pre -GAD T1 and post-GADolinium images. We trained the model to start predicting, given the pre-GAD pre T1 image, can you predict what the post-GAD image is going to look like? And this is what, it's a patch GAN method, I don't, we don't want to go into the details of it, but if you actually look at the image enhancement and the uptake, you, and this is the actual post-GAD T1 image, I think the predictions are very good. We can't call this gadolinium uh, enhanced imaging, so we call it synthetic inflammation imaging because we're using the T1 image to generate essentially the gadolinium image. What has this done for your imaging? This could cut down your imaging time by a factor of two because now you no longer need to do a post-GAD image. You no longer need to give gadolinium. It's making imaging faster if this were easily validated and accepted and we could move it into the clinic. Okay, this is all the arrows. Synthetic T1 row imaging. Okay, I've talked about T1 row imaging, but we're doing T1 row and T2 imaging. There are clear differences between T1 row and T2, but given a training set, can we generate the T1 row images? This is literally hot off the press. The paper hasn't even gone in. We've trained the model, and this is essentially the ground truth versus the predicted T1 row uh, imaging. And you can see, depending on what cartilage compartment we are looking at, the predictions are pretty good. More impressive probably is to look at the images. This is the ground, these are the ground truth images. Just look at these features, high values of T1 row in the ground truth and we're actually regenerating the same pattern. So if we were able, and, and the T2 image looks nothing really like the T1 row image. So there is information in the T1 row and T2 image, in the images that we have trained and we've extracted some T1 row type data. You can't call it T1 row, so I don't know what we'll call it. We'll call it probably synthetic, uh, pro, I don't know, proteoglycan Im imaging. But again, there are ways of doing this and the only reason, these are models which are being trained to do this, to reduce image acquisition. But I keep bringing up all this whole joint disease, all these features, these bones, uh, morphology, tissue, biochemistry, what are we going to do with all of this data? So using the OAI data, one of the grad students, Gabby, has taken all of this data and created essentially a uh, 100 parameter space because you've got t all the various compartments, you've got cartilage and you've got the bone segmentation, the bone map, the T2 map, then you've got all the demographic information and she's created this entire 3D space and looked at each patient on a Euclidean matrix like this and using a, a graphing method called 3D Disney, they, she's basically got people who are, by looking at their distance on this particular space, Looking at people who look identical from their perspective of the uh, clinical findings, the clinical metri biometrics, as well as those who look identical from the imaging feature space. So you can find two people who are identical along the spaces, and if you start looking at people who are imaging twins in this, in, in this, in this uh, setup, if you look at imaging twins first, uh, and you look 
and you start looking at people uh, who should cause control subjects, then the knees throughout the entire duration, their radiographic status did not change, and in those where the radiographic, the OA, there was OA development. They started at Kelvin lorentz scale of zero or one, but they increased to a higher Kelvin lorentz scale. And if you look at these people uh, as imaging twins who are identical in imaging feature space, the factors that stand out and the differences in clinical parameters are things like weight, BMI, uh, some of the functional features, etc., show up being equivalent. Okay, these are imaging twins. That's what you're seeing. But the more interesting thing is if you have people who are twins from all of the other features like age, gender, body mass index, some of the other features of pain and so on. If you start looking at people as what we call, the, we term them as clinical twins, what are the features that actually show up? And there are some features, for example, cartilage thickness in the femur. The, we've, we've taken the femur, the entire surface, and derived, done principal component analysis, so this is one of the components. The, for example, cartilage thickness in the femur shows up as being significant. Cartilage T2 becomes significant. Some of the meniscus uh, parameters become significant in some of these clinical twins. So what is this telling us? Why does it matter? Because ultimately, if you do have a database of people, individuals in this kind of format, then you can start looking at people who are clinical twins and then actually see what are the features that are different between your subject who and his clinical twin? In, and are these the ones which actually lead to progression of joint degeneration, radiographic osteoarthritis? So there's a lot of ability, large data like this can provide a lot of answers. So at UCSF, we have the information commons, everything you need for translationing, translating data science in one place, including the electronic health records, imaging data, etc. And so you can actually start to doing some of this characterization of the MR images. And we've just scratched the surface. We've just characterized a bunch of subjects who've had meniscal uh, uh, injuries. And we found that they have a variety of uh, uh, surgical, non-surgical therapeutics assigned to them. But one of the things we want to find out is who undergoes likelihood to have surgery a significant likelihood is based on insurance. Now we want to put in some of these imaging features and see does is that changing some of who, the decisions as to who goes in for surgery. Very early on studies, but large data can inform further things moving down the line. I have very little time left. I, ha I want to leave some time for questions. I'm literally going to say that quantitative <coughs> imaging and lower back pain is extremely important for all the similar reasons. Imaging is used, the correlation between imaging and back pain, you know, in this cohort is extremely difficult. But with using artificial intelligence, you can actually have objective segmentation of tissues. You can quantitate image alignment. For example, scoliosis can be trained relatively easily. You can get muscle cross-sectional areas and composition if they were segmented easily. Disc composition and morphology can be extracted from MR images, nerves can be tracked, and one can actually look at end plate changes or modic changes in a more standardized way. Most of the machine learning that has been applied to lower back pain to date has not worked in the realm of actually looking at the imaging, which is what the, using the backpack, which is an NIH funded study we are doing now, moving AI to characterize the lumbar spine and do some of the same things that we've done Oh, uh, uh, essentially segmentation of the muscles, discs, vertebral bodies, ultimately building biomechanical models of individual loading in each of the vertebral levels. These are the things that will inform us moving forward as to what, how important each of the structures are overall in lower back pain. I know I'm rushing, but canal stenosis Again, so much variability between mild, moderate, and severe stenosis from radiological grading, from orthopedic grading. Quantifying that using segmentation, AI holds the potential to do that and make imaging far more useful in the area of lower back pain. Lesion detection, modic changes, nerves, I'm not going into these details. Uh, but one of the things I will talk about is deep learning based 
image reconstruction. I haven't talked about that at all. We are actually doing that for noise reduction so that we can actually get faster images. Imagine getting much faster lumbar spine images. We've shown that using deep learning and noise reduction, we can reconstruct images uh, obtained at a much shorter imaging time. For lower back pain patients, this would be a boon. But can we, using the same images with deep learning reconstruction, actually start get extracting the features we have, such as modic changes, using our AI algorithms, and we've shown, yes, you can. So if you can do all of these things, then the next thing we need is an objective measure of pain. So what is Backpack doing? Backpack is actually also collecting fMRI to actually connect our regions of the brain so that we can be doing this. So combining, my, my entire talk has been combining the multifaceted ways you can combine imaging, quantitative imaging and AI to get a better description of the individual subjects in pain and degeneration. And that's basically my point at this, uh, in, in this particular talk. And with that, I'm going to end and say thank you with a few key people who have actually made this possible. And they're shown here. Other people who've done the work were shown, if you noticed on the slides, can't go through everybody and all their names. But I really would li like to tell you that I'm not doing all of the work. I clearly have an amazing group, an amazing group of collaborators and colleagues who helped me in this journey. And with that, I brought to you the potential of using AI in musculoskeletal imaging to make orthopedic surgery in the next de decade a far more quantitative uh, assessment of the entire joint or whatever we are looking at patho pathology for the patient. So with that, thank you, and I'll open up for questions. I did leave 10 minutes. Before. the orthopedic surgeons. We are working with Ben Ma and Drew Lansdowne and others in some of our knee studies. But uh, to be perfectly honest, using osteoarthritis initiative, which is sort of an epidemiological data set, there is no orthopedic surgeon who is going to change their, uh, moda, you know, their mode of treatment today. I mean, even if we take their patient and say, hey, this is where this patient sits, I think that there requires to be a validation and an outcome assessment phase where we need to put this out into the clinic so that every patient that is coming through to you as the, as the orthopedic surgeon or to the radiologist, the radiologist gets the map, looks at it, agrees, disagrees, orthopedic surgeon looks at it and then decides whether, whether they will do it. It really needs to be almost in a, for the lower back pain, we're doing a randomized study trying to direct it that you do the injections at the level that the imaging is telling you to do, etc. So that hasn't happened yet. I think the hurdle is that that has to happen. I don't think there will be any living, I don't know, maybe there are other surgeons here who will basically change their method of treatment, but I don't think it's either responsible or uh, they'll do it. If somebody will, I'll take them up on it. But it's highly risky, I think. It's a fascinating talk, thank you very much. Uh, this is sort of focused on like a super skinny slice of research. I mean, it strikes me that there's tremendous potential if you could, forgive my crew, teach the machine to read plain x-rays. That would impact the entire globe. What is the progress of teaching AI to read plain x-rays? Depends on what, so it's being used. So, for example, there are we, there are algorithms not just for our, that we develop, but others have as well for fracture, non-fracture, so hip fracture detection. Detection. Regu there's, there's companies actually that have come up for fracture detection, overall wrist fracture, all fractures, vertebral fractures, osteoporosis, all of those fracture predictions. So there's that gamut for musculoskeletal. Then there is the gamut that basically is Kevin Lawrence scale. I showed you that. Okay, great. There's hip osteoarthritis, there's algorithms for that. Uh, trauma, uh, but basically a generalized algorithm which says 
fracture, trauma, osteoarthritis, uh, some other osteogenesis, I don't know. All these other different things are more very generalized across pediatrics, uh, across all ages. That I have not seen and it hasn't happened. And it really depends on the amount, it really will depend on the data and the variability. There's so much data variability that you actually get in many of these. I mean, in scoliosis films, for example, we've got scoliosis films in lumbar spine. So is, it, is there scoliosis? We can train for, we've trained for individual things like that, but the general large scale training that you're talking about, just reading any kind of plain x-rays and just let me vet it out, it's been, it's, I don't think we've, we've done that, just because we've, we've done it in a very focused, the group, the uh, community has done it in a very focused way to actually see, where, and that's basically the data availability in any given center, I think has basically been the issue. Uh, but I think given what's going on with the rest of AI and chatbot, there are so many people who want to do this chat GPT of imaging. They want to gather all the images possible for everything and be able to query it. When you have that volume of data, maybe we will get there. How do you see the field of clinical radiology being different in 10 years? In 10 years? I think we will have a lot of these algorithms which might make things a little bit faster, assist in the readings, maybe introduce some of the quantitation that we've talked about and be able to put many of the radiologists and many of the different disciplines are asking for some of these quantitative metrics to be put out, etc. So I think that we'll see that difference, but I don't believe that, you know, um, I think people will be using AI and I don't know who said it, that people, the, it, 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 you will see the difference between radiologists who, who use AI versus those who do not. But I think, you know, the reality is it is going to make its way in and hopefully it make it, make it faster, more quantitative and so on and so forth. At least that's my vision. But uh, yeah, I, I think it will, if we can use it and direct it to provide more of these quantitative metrics, I think the definition and the utilization of imaging will be far better. And actually the global access to many of these things, specialized readings, many places don't have musculoskeletal radiologists, they have general radiologists. So I think that will improve it. It will definitely improve the field of radiology, I feel, if you could have some of these things. Could you comment on the sample size needed? Some of your studies have many, many thousands of patients. LOA has a few thousand. Some of your smaller studies have 50 patients. So I'm wondering, how do you think about the necessary sample size in order to make a reliable prediction? So, most of our smaller sample size studies have been used particularly uh, with uh, regards to, they're not really prediction models in the sam smaller sample sizes that we've done. Those smaller sample sizes, those are our NIH studies of a few hundred patients, etc., are primarily used in the realm of segmentation, where the large numbers of slices in itself add more data to it, so I think that works out very well. This is what I mean, that some of the OAI type studies, the predictive deep pain changes in shape, etc., are phenomenal to do it in that large data set, but in order to actually extend it, I think our studies are very small with the smaller subject size, we're not going to be, and we will never get that timeline. But I think if we get the large, those predictive studies and characterization of patients, the twin studies, etc., I think we need a large number of subjects. And that's why we're trying to use Information Commons, our platform, to go into our entire PAC system. But even a single PAC system probably gives you patients of the order of tens of thousands to actually really talk about, you know, digital and clinical twins, etc. for that methodology. We need much more data, much more, ge you need gender, you need ethnicities, you need all of those different factors in there. So it really depends what is the type of model you're building. For segmentation, correlation between knee and hip, correlation between biomechanics and uh, you know, those kinds of trends on a smaller basis, I think we'll be able to do in our smaller cohort size. But some of these other things, we need many, many more questions. So, Dr. Ramesh, with your hospital nurse initiative data set, the, the input data was pretty standardized. But the discussion you've been having in the last few minutes is that you need huge amounts of data that are also standardized. How do you use these data to inform and suggest to the community how to standardize them? Oh, well, no. 
I'm not going to try and standardize things across. That's going to be really difficult. I think what I would do is I would build the models to be generalizable. And you're right, because you brought up the issue. Are my models now generalizable? Can I just take my model and apply it to the PACs? Even our clinical data, research data versus clinical data. For the lower back pain, we used our clinical data to develop the segmentation models. But for the knee data, the osteoarthritis data was... I mean, it was draconian the way they standardized those acquisitions. That's not happening today in the clinic anywhere, in any academic radiology setting even. It's not happening. So you want your model to be sort of insensitive to that. So that's what we're trying to do and make it generalizable. And uh, th th that generalizability comes from model training, retraining, continuous learning of the model to actually deal with those data sets. But in MRI, for example, images acquired on GE versus Siemens, some the, the spaces are not the same. You actually have to take, you actually have to train a model to take images which are GE-like and convert them into, or Siemens-like, convert them into the GE make it look like a GE image and then run your model on it. So we are looking at different ways of generalizability of the models across the <coughs> acquisitions, different field strengths. So it's, it's, that in itself is the area of research. That if you want to deploy it large scale, if I say that every human being please, who has had an MRI of the knee, upload your knee and your uh, iPhone data and some of your demographic data, we want to build this thing to actually Gen basically normalize that model, uh, I mean normalize that data and get it into the same space and actually develop a model, etc. is going to take work. So there's a lot more work to be done before we go into this generalizability phase, but the potential is there and the only way we can do it is by taking some of these models, putting it out, deploying it, and validating it in clinical data and seeing, okay, what is it that we need to change because without knowing that we are not going to be able to develop the generalizability platforms. So uh, just to address that, there's a real disconnect between what, what the people that really are computer scientists and developing algorithms because the goal there for a technical person is to have the best robust algorithm which is going to be generalizable across this space, that space, this dimensionality, etc. and come up with a formula and a theorem. But then when you put it up in, and into real practice, there's no need for that generalizability, right? The knee, if it goes into the magnet, can only go in a particular way and have a particular orientation. You're not going to cut off my leg and put it out horizontally, so don't give me that generalizability. So I think there's a real connectivity issue between A, the algorithm developers, we need to take some of the generalizable algorithms, the models and the ways of doing it and reducing things in a space and relate it to the particular uh, organ or the particular thing in question really. I think that's what's going to be really important. Great, well let's thank our speaker once more.